hi everyone. <clears throat> Whatever time of day it is for you, welcome to our webinar and it's going to be covering approaches to address the system qualification of the SimSip simulator. My name is uh, Oliver Hatley, I'm a principal scientist at SimSip Satara and before I invite Karen to talk I'm just going to go over a few uh, housekeeping notes. Um, I'm sure some of you will be wondering, yes, this session is being recorded. So if you missed a bit, you should be able to watch the recording back and uh, listen again. And the slides will also be available uh, on request. Um, as you may have noticed, you're all on mute, but that doesn't mean you can't interact with us. So we've got a um, QA uh, facility, which is live throughout the duration of the webinar today. So please submit your questions and uh, we'll be taking questions and putting them to Karen at the um, end of this session. In terms of the rest of the agenda, um, over the next hour, we're gonna be first hearing from Karen about PPK modeling requirements, uh, regulatory requirements. Then we'll stop for a quick poll um, yeah, just to make sure you're paying attention, make sure you're not too distracted by emails, you can interact with us, have a few questions. And then finally, we're going to cover um, approaches to address qualification, looking at the recent CPT PSP publication, uh, focusing on qualification of the SimSip simulator for SIP mediated drug drug interactions involving inhibition. Karen, I'm sure, needs no introduction to the people on the line. Uh, previously, she was head of uh, PVPK Consulting Services for eight years. So she has plenty of experience interacting with clients and regulators. So uh, no surprises, she's now the SVP of Client and Regulatory Strategy uh, for Satara. Okay, Karen, I'll pass over to you. Right. Thank you very much, Ollie. Uh, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Right. Let's try and move on to the next slide. Always a problem. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, before we move on and um, talk about the uh, recent publication that we had on the uh, qualification, what I wanted to do is just take a step back from that and talk about, um, you know, what we mean by qualification. And um, and so if we think about uh, model informed drug development, um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about it, a lot in the uh, regulatory uh, guidance um, talking about it. And, um, and and one of the things that I wanted to point out was that, um, you know, the FDA recently um, introduced their model informed drug development pilot program. And one of the things that they mentioned as being new on there was, um, did you know that under the pilot program, they're asking the MIDD meeting requests and meeting packages to include elements of a credibility framework? And it's envisaged that this will facilitate alignment and streamline, streamline review. And so what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about that as well. Because as you can imagine, you know, when we're talking about M MIDD and uh, looking at the different modeling approaches that you have on the right hand side, POPPK, exposure response, PBPK systems pharmacology. You know, when we're talking about applying MIDD in terms of context of use, it's important then that we have more uh, streamlined or more documented processes to be able to actually address this. So it, when you're thinking about MIDD approaches in drug development, typically, um, you know, in regulatory applications, they've been routinely used, you know, for optimized dosing, provide evidence, uh, you know, supportive evidence for efficacy, informing clinical design and uh, guide regulatory policy. But what we're seeing more of is an increasing number of occasions when quantitative models have served as primary evidence, you know, proving especially useful when clinical trials are not feasible or ethical. And this is something, you know, certainly that I'm not going to speak to the other MIDD approaches, but what I am going to talk about is obviously PBBK modeling. 
And there's been an increasing impact of PBBK modeling on the label, especially when we're talking about um, clinical DDI studies. I'm not going to take you through all of this, but just to show that, you know, these are increasing every week, every month, we're putting more on here, more instances of when PBBK modeling has been used to support the label and also in uh, regulatory submissions. So now moving on to the credibility assessment framework, it's not really surprising that when you think of the number of submissions that are being done to the regulators, um, globally that is, in terms of the um, PBBK modeling, that we're seeing more of these types of uh, documents and publications where we're being asked to consider a credibility assessment framework in MIDD and potential application to PBBK modeling in simulation. And this paper was published a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to take you through all of these steps, but just to let you know that the, one of the main um, areas of interest with respect to this credibility assessment framework is talking about context of use and defining the question to be addressed. Also looking at the impact of the model in terms of the influence and also the decision consequence that it's going to have that you have to make an assessment of the model risk and then bearing all of that in mind, come up with a validation plan. And of course, this is actually based on the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and it was for assessment of the credibility of computational models used for medical device applications. So what it's trying to do is streamline this approach. And as I mentioned in a, a slide couple of slides, sorry, in the slide couple of ago, that really what we're trying to do is streamline the regulatory approach. And, um, and so what I'm going to do is talk you through this um, over the next couple of slides and particularly focus on the context of use, which we're hearing a lot more about, and also in terms of defining the question to be addressed. So if we think about a typical scenario for CYP3A4 substrates, one of the main questions that we want to know is that if we've got an investigational drug, you know, how should this drug be dosed when co-administered with CYP3A4 modulators? And this is, would be our question of interest. In terms of the context of use of the PBBK modeling, Typically, we would have clinical data available with strong 3A4 modulators, uh, inhibitors, and also inducers. And what we're trying to do is essentially use the PBBK modeling to inform on these DDI studies with weak and moderate um, 3A4 modulators. So we would be using simulation to predict the effects of weak and moderate 3A4 induce, uh, modulators on the investigational drug. And then this would be followed up. We'd be using these predictions to try and guide dosing recommendations in label. So we've defined the question, and then we've defined the context of use of the model and what we're actually wanting to uh, use it for. So if we think about then the model development process for PBPK, we would have the uh, model construction, um, we would have the in vitro data and whatever clinical PK data were available, we would develop a model, then we would utilize our two clinical DDI studies if they were available. We had the itraconazole and rifampin study. So we're talking about here typical, typically a CYP3A4 substrate. And of course, what we would do then is verify the model or refine it if necessary so that we can capture the two clinical DDI studies. And then we would apply this model to untested clinical scenarios. So in other words, we can moderate 3A4 inhibitors and inducers. And then what we would try and do is utilize the magnitude of interaction to extrapolate to a dose adjustment. And of course, this is the typical model development process that's been, uh, been referenced as best practice and been uh, mentioned time and time again in a number of the uh, global, guide, uh, global regulatory guidance documents. But when we think of the regulatory assessment, what I talked about in the previous slide was developing that uh, model for the investigational drug. 
and then going through that process. And typically what we would do is prepare a report describing the data that we utilized, describing the model development process, the verification steps, and all of the steps that were actually uh, involved in the um, application as well. And also included in that, we would perhaps discuss sensitivity analysis, the context of the data, and uh, any um, uh, uncertainty associate, associated with it. But this is all with respect to confidence in the drug model itself. After that, we would then be wanting to know what, what is the confidence in the context of use. So in other words, we've taken that model. We've applied it now to these untested scenarios where we're looking at the effect of weak and moderate inhibitors or inducers within the platform. So we're utilizing a combination of the compound files and the algorithms within the platform to try and capture um, data with other substrates. So we've got the drug model itself, but then we've got the confidence in the context of use or the intended use. And therefore, we would be expected to provide additional supporting documentation in the form of perhaps compound file summary. So within the SimSip simulator, we have a documentation for each of the compound files that we have in there, indicating the source of the data and also verifying each of them against the different substrates or inhibitors, depending on whether we're talking about an inhibitor or a substrate. And then what we could do is, in support of that context of use, provide a short report providing the level of confidence that we have when utilizing these weak, moderate inhibitors and inducers within the platform. But also, in addition to these individual reports, there are many publications out there in the literature as well where the SimSip simulator has been used for 3A4, for many other enzymes and many, many, many other scenarios. And so I suppose really when we're talking about the, uh, providing confidence in the context of use, we could be talking about, as I said, publications that are in the um, public domain, collating the reports and also providing the compound file summaries. So there's the report for the confidence in the drug model and then providing that additional support itself. And really, I think this is what I want to focus on in the uh, second session here. It's how do we actually address this? Because there's no, it's not stipulated in any of the documents. It's indicated that you've got to provide, um, you know, supporting documentation for the context of use, but it, uh, there aren't clear indications uh, in any of the guidances about the level of support required. And in fact, you know, um, in, in some cases, it appears that the level of supporting documentation appears to be associated with regulatory impact. So if we look at the um, you know, EMA guidance on uh, the reporting of PBPK modeling and simulation, you know, what they indicated very clearly was that it depends on the regulatory impact of the simulation. So if you look at this schematic here, we've got low, medium, and high regulatory impact. And obviously, when we're talking about high regulatory impact, what we're talking about here is potentially replacing clinical studies or looking at non-studied scenarios or reinforcing sparse data. At the bottom of this, you can see that if the model is going to be used for in-house decision-making only, it's got low regulatory impact and therefore the level of qualification or verification is actually relatively small. So, on top of the um, actual documentation in the form of um, publications and also individual reports and compound file summaries that I've talked about so far, what the EMA have indicated is that what they would like to see is a formal EM a qualification process that they would have the opportunity to review. And when we're talking about qualification, just an example here, if you, were, if you wanted to know or quantify the effects of an investigational drug being a victim of a drug interaction, so in other words, if you've got a CYP3A4 drug and you want to uh, run, you run simulations with um, a weak or moderate uh, CYP3A4 inducers and inhibitors and you want to waive clinical studies, then it's expected that you sub submit a supporting level of documentation. And what they've indicated here, that in order to qualify the ability of a PBBK platform to predict the effect of inhibition on a specific enzyme, then what we would need is a pre-specified qualification data set. 
And this should, if possible, consist of a series of drug uh, substances. So you've got victims and perpetrators. And what they want to see are victim drugs, you know, that um, eliminated to variable extents through the metabolism, through the, sorry, through the enzyme of, of interest. So in this, so in this case, we're talking about CYP3A4.